Welcome to the Scarf Begar War, proudly sponsored by the Players' Entrance at Covent Garden Cafe and the Royal Oak Edgerly. Oh, great flick up by Alan Armstrong. Dark days, dark. I'll say. Yeah, them days were dark, weren't they? They were dark, them days. They were dark, alright. I've never seen days so dark. Some of the darkest days ever they were. Yeah, they were right fucking dark. Welcome to Dark Days Part 3. It's the one you've been waiting for. Um, apologies for the delay. Bit bit longer than we thought it would be, but um, we're here nonetheless. Uh, we ended the last podcast, last Dark Days Part Two, on the final day of the season um, in 2011. Um, and can I just say, hopefully the sound is better because we are using our new Fandangle kit, which everybody's impressed with. I can see by the faces. It's like a professional <laughs> setup. It's that good we can't see each other. <laughs> <laughs> can I just say something? Because otherwise, I won't appear on this. <laughs> Introduce yourself. I'm Dave Esboy. Hi, Dave. And um, we've got Dave Schofield. Hello, everybody. And we've got Phil Brennan. Yeah, that's me. I'm Phil Brennan. Uh, okay, so we'll start where we finished the last one then. Uh, last day of the season, 2011. Who wants to take it? Well, just, just as a catch-up on, obviously we, we got relegated from the Football League uh, on that final day. But there was something that happened before it that I'd, I'd, I thought I'd mentioned, and then listening back, I hadn't. And there was obviously a lot of fallout at the board between, towards the end of the season, between the, the board directors with Alwyn and having to sack Paul Simpson. So he left, he ended his resignation in because he didn't want to sack him. And we had to sack, well, we did sack him no matter what. On the last day of the season, when it was, we were already relegated because we'd been, we'd drawn with Northampton and lost at Crewe. So the last game of the season was against Cheltenham Town. And it was a big crowd, to be fair. It was a big crowd, even though you know it was a sad day. Everybody turned out to sort of wave goodbye to the Football League after all those years. And as I was about to take my seat, I was walking up towards the press box. I recognised a, a sort of half a face. There was a, a chap sat there. He had a, a cap pulled right down on his head, a scarf wrapped round his face. <laughs> and it was Alwyn Thompson. And he'd sort of disguised himself, got different glasses on. His face was all covered up and he had his hat pulled right down, but I recognised him. And I thought it was really weird, because he'd not been to a game since he'd resigned. And, and I said, all right, Alwyn. And he looked at me, he went, uh, uh, hiya. I didn't think he'd recognise me. I said, why are you in disguise? And he went, well, yeah, I am, sort of. I said, well, why would you do that? He said, well, I just want to be here to watch her face when this club gets relegated. Oh, fuck, you know, really? And I looked at him and I went, it's not her club, it's my club, it's their club, it should have been your club, you're a disgrace. And I walked up to my seat and I, I just, I couldn't believe that the man who wanted to be king had come to celebrate at the club's relegation nice, from the Football yeah. League and I, I was, and today, all Petty, these years later. Petty point scoring was more important to him yeah, than the club actually being relegated. But all these years later, it still makes me angry. That somebody would do that. I knew it. I didn't know about that. That's well, it, it, I mean, I told. I well, obviously got up to the press box and told JK and people that, and I, I, it annoys me, and it still annoys me today that, that he was going to be one of our saviors, and he couldn't wait to watch us disappear into the mire because of, like you say, point scoring mm-hmm. with Mary and Tony or whoever else he'd got a, a you know a beef with, um, so. It's not just that, is it? I mean, it's, it's, it's how twisted Jeff the Bee is. Like, he's a retired guy. He's got his, he's sold his park bakery yeah. business for 100 and odd million quid. And, you know, he's living in a nice life in the middle of Cheshire with his big house. Why would he actually give a fuck? Why would that, <laughs> why would you be that spiteful 
I don't know. To but... turn up in disguise and basically dance on the grave of the football club. Yeah. Well, it happened. That's terrible. I, 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 anyway, never Do you mind. share my anger now, Dave? You fucking ruined my night already. <laughs> <laughs> Has he been back since? I'm, well, I don't know. I just, it, it, you wouldn't know, would you? Because he was disguised. <laughs> well, he checked obviously, Vernon Bear recently. <laughs> he, obviously, he obviously pulled, <laughs> his, pulled hat, his head off. Because his hair was he's so white, shock of hair, wasn't it? Um, so that's why he pulled his cap right down, so he wouldn't... I mean, you'd see it, you'd spot him a mile off. And it's a bit like you're around now, Dave. Beautiful, it's beautiful. So that was just... I just thought, you know, I, just, I thought I'd mentioned it last time. And when I listened back and I thought, oh... People need to know that. <laughs> yeah, they do. So there you go. Sorry, I'll win, but it happened. You know, mm. you're a twat. Um, so I suppose it's, if, I, if I start part three and then you can dive in in a minute here. Yeah, so. It's your show with this one. So, <laughs> yeah, don't say that. <laughs> so we've had a, obviously, we've, there was a couple of things that I've not actually written down. I have made quite a big list, but... Just to be clear, you were employed by the club at this time oh, yes, throughout yes. this entire period yeah, we're talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. So that's why you know yeah. these inside I'm not stories. making it up. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not writing a Did book. you get it off the other board then? No. <laughs> um, so, because I'd sort of realised about maybe four or five games to go, that even though I thought Roy, Ray was close, I just felt we weren't going to stay up. We just hadn't... Basically, we had to win more games in the last five games of the season and we'd won all season, pretty much. So it was pretty, pretty obvious we weren't going to do it. So I'd started ringing around people at Wrexham, Grimsby, all the clubs that we'd been close to and had, had been in non-league for a while and said to them, look, you know, what's it like on the other side? <laughs> you know, it was, it was a bit... And the one thing that kept coming back from every single former... Club, we got it. We're right. Every, the same thing kept coming back. The worst mistake we made as a club was promising our fans that we would come straight back. He said it's the worst thing we did because you raise expectation level. He said you know that they want to hear it, but you, he said you got to resist saying it because every club out there, you're the team they want to beat. Yeah. He said like Grimsby, a couple of years they'd been down a couple of years. Wrexham fans wanted to beat Grimsby because they couldn't manage to get back up, and mm. you know. So it was really, and that was the one thing that kind of on, on every sort of email I'd had, that was the biggest. That was number one. That was the thing that on. The, give me five reasons, that things we've got to not look forward to next year. Number one was always don't tell your fans you're gonna go straight. Uh, and it's a weird relegation, isn't it? Because obviously you're devastated because you're out of the football league, but in terms of the quality of the league that you're in. You get relegated into arguably a stronger top half of the league. You, you probably the amount, do. But the amount of teams that win the uh, conference and then just get promoted again is is unreal. Yeah. So you get it's it's not like most but relegations the, the, where you go to a base. lower standard. You yeah. kind of well, the fan base fans. automatically when you've been relegated, you fan, no matter what level you get relegated from, your fan base automatically. I will f- piss this. League. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah but you that. just lost seventeen games out of twenty, <laughs> and you're just going to turn it round. But it happens. That's what all fans do. So I've made all these notes, and we're, we're having a meeting on on the Monday. You know, just to, to plan on what we're going to do next. And obviously, my job is to put messages on the on the website. So there's a meeting going to take place in the infamous boardroom. And I'm not in it. And I said to Tony Gibbon, Tony Gibbon said, hey, are you, come on, meeting's starting. I said, I'm not on the list. And he went, what do you mean you're not on the list? I said, well, I'm not on the list. I've not been invited. Mr. Lord Snape sent out a list of people he wants to attend and I'm not on it. He went, well, who's going to write the report? I said, well, <laughs> I know that, but I'm not on it. He went, come on in, you come. So I walked in and Mr. Snape who and I, we weren't great friends. And he, he sort of looked at me and he went, what are you doing here? I said, I've come to make some notes for the website because I'm assuming you're putting a statement together. Ah, all right, you've not got a talking part. <laughs> it's like, right, OK. So I was sitting there making notes. And, and, they start, and they've started talking, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. I said, can I just briefly, one little thing, can I just say one little thing? I've spoken to all these clubs and the one thing we can't type out is to tell our fans we're going straight back because it doesn't work and it causes problems. And, Anyway, in the end, if you, I, I'm fairly sure that in my first press release after that meeting, it said, "We will come straight back." You know, it's basically you're writing what I tell you to write, and it was like, okay, well, you have got to live with the consequences. Yeah, it sounds like you just made all this up. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we get over that. So we started having interviews for a new manager because we needed a new manager. Ray Mathias had actually put his 
he hadn't actually put his hat in at first because I think we said before Andy his wife had been poorly and because yeah. he'd been at county so much in that short period of time he'd booked a holiday he'd going away to Mexico and I can't remember who it was maybe Tony, Tony Gibbons somebody said to him so you're not applying for the job and he went well I won't get it will I and he said well why not you're well respected everyone at the club likes you why wouldn't you apply I, for I, it and genuinely I don't think anybody any can when, when, it, when it does finally get announced that he gets given yeah. the job the reaction was totally positive, wasn't yeah. it? It was like, yeah, so fine. He said, well, Ray, you know, you're the man in position. We like what you did. And he went, well, my contract was till the end of the season, so I just assumed you didn't want me back because he's just like that sort of bloke. So he said, well, would you want to put your name in there? He said, yeah, I would, actually. I would like to apply for the job, but I just thought that my contract was till then. So he puts his name in that, and some fairly, well, all the usual non-league big names were applying. Uh, Graham Roberts applied who. um used to be a manager used to play for Tottenham but he was a manager in Scotland and d- done quite well in Scotland But so he applied but I remember him walking off shaking his head after, I don't know who was doing the interviews I, I, I'll think about who was doing the interviews Gosh. but I know that Lord Snape was one of them I think Tony, Tony Gibbons would have been one there was, there was a few doing these interviews and I just remember seeing Tony Roberts and wasn't going to say his name is now Graham Roberts walking out to the car park shaking his head and I'm like well he's not coming back <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, it, over a short period of time they decided that Ray was the best man for the job so they offer him the job on the manager's wage and off he goes to Mexico and he says look I, I can't cancel it all it's for the wife this that and the other during the time Ray was on holiday I can guarantee you that he was on the phone <coughs> pretty much well every day but at different times of the day speaking to um, obviously Peter and w- Wardy and Lordy I think got a two year deal so they were still there but they were now working under R- Ray so he was on the phone constantly arranging to get this player in that, and that so even though he was on holiday in Mexico for a well deserved rest he actually was on the phone every day or in contact with the club every day different members I spoke to him certainly a few times so as Dave just said the news comes out raises the new manager and pretty much everything was positive yeah so you're going to talk about the things the issues that were still going on in the background well it j- just just sort of you know we talked about Fred Carnot's circus and I like that little bit of a musical interlude <laughs> in the last one that was very apt it was good that um a lot of people have commented on, on the Start Days podcast. I think, I think the reaction's been good. A lot of people have enjoyed Absolutely, it. And, yeah. um, but there's been a lot of kind of shock, horror, and what, you know, what else was there and what else was there. I and I'll just say, before you go on, it's funny that you, you're dead right, that's what's happening, but it, it makes me despair at times because a lot of this was being said, not all of it, but some of this was being said at the time, and people just don't want to believe what they hear. Oh, absolutely, yeah. They, they want to believe what they want to believe yeah. rather than the actual truth because you, you were clearly involved. You you. Everyone knew you were in, employed by them, Phil. Dave, you were involved in the 2015 setup, and you've been saying for years about you know the makeup that we talked about last time, the makeup of the 2015 um, organisation from the start and when, when people actually joined it. And yeah. no matter how often you said it, even though you set the fucking thing up, people were still saying, "Oh, what's his name? He didn't join in the first start. He was two years before he joined us." And it's just you despair at times. Yeah, you and, and 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 you know, I, as you lot will know, I've got very thick skin. I don't worry about what people you know say and think of. But, but certain things stick in your mind. And, and I remember people saying to me, well, well you bear responsibility for this. <laughs> and, I, and I'd say, well, I don't bear any responsibility. I, I put together a wealthy group of business people who were either from Stockport, or Stockport the County fans, yeah. blah, 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 and said, this is what we're going to do. There's the plans, off you go. And I said, right from the word go, I wasn't going to get involved at all. Um, even that I've got to say jamboree because I feel like I need to say that word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, even even that, it's like I don't want to be yeah. on that stage because I, I genuinely didn't want to be involved at all. You know, I had I had, I had a, a lot a lot to to deal with myself. Um, coming cold turkey off a class A drug, you know, and being serious, it was it was a pretty difficult time for me in my in my life. Anyway, so we've got all this going on and. Ray Mathias has been offered the job and it's been accepted. He's going on holiday. I get um, a phone call from... Uh, I'll get an email, actually, from a guy who's a, he's an exiled Stockport County fan. I've never said what his name is because he asked me not to. 
And he said to me, funnily enough, he said, when you were trying to put a, a group together, I wanted to help you, but I was ill at the time too. He said, and um, I, didn't, I didn't have any time, still haven't got any time, but uh, I, I you know, have money. And um, I was wondering whether it's too late to, to, to put some money into the football club. Uh, to help them, so bear in mind we've just been relegated. Yeah. So I said, well, I, I'm sure that I'm sure that that would be uh, greatly appreciated. But the reality is, I I'm not involved, and quite honestly, I'm I'm not welcome at the club either. You know, I, I've I've been really quite critical of them for a, a few months because they had from about February, I think I said last time. Yeah. I told them they all needed to fuck off and leave the keys for fits <laughs> in, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Can't think why you wouldn't be welcome so, after that. So, <laughs> So this, so this guy said, he said, well, the thing is, you're the only person that, I, that uh, I know has done anything, you know. I wanted to help you uh, last year and I couldn't. I've got £45,000, which I can let you have. I'll give it you and you give it to the football club. So I said, don't do that. You know, don't, 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 I don't need your money. I don't need to be involved. What do you mean, give so he said, I don't want any shares, I don't want I don't want anything at all. I just want to give the money to the football club so that the football club can benefit from the money I really should have given twelve months ago had I been well. So I said, Well that's remarkable, to be honest. And um you know, you sure you don't want anything for, nope, don't want anything for it and specifically don't want anything for it and I don't want even anybody else to know my name. So I said, Right, Jim, no problem. So he says <laughs> <laughs> so he says, um, I'm going to give you the money. So I said, don't do that. Let me get in touch with somebody at the football club and see who's the best person to speak to. I'm sure they will gratefully receive your £45,000 and they definitely need the money. <laughs> um, that's fantastic. I think you're brilliant. I'll get back in touch with you in a couple of days. So you would think uh, that I had lots of contacts at the football club, but like I said, no one really wanted to talk to me. So I phoned, uh, phoned up and I spoke to you, didn't I? And I said, I know it sounds odd, but I've got a guy who really wanted to invest last year. He was ill at the same time. He's not ill now. He hasn't got any time, but he has got money. He wants to put £45,000 into the football club. He doesn't want any shares, doesn't want anything. He just wants to give you the money. And that should be how difficult do we think? If somebody offers to give you <laughs> £45,000, how long do you think it would take you if you're running a business, to gratefully accept that £45,000, send him a nice letter thanking him for his contribution and saying at some point in the future, if he ever, ever, ever decides that he wants to be able to have some kind of public recognition, we'll make sure that you get it. Well, if it's, is it the days of checks? How long does the check play? <laughs> if, if not, it's, it's e-banking, so same day. So, so he literally could have transferred the money that day. He yeah. could have sent the letter or email out that minute, and that would have been the end of the matter, because he literally wanted that to be the end of the matter. Right? And, um, oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I complicated matters, didn't I, Phil? Well, look, there, was a sl there was one fly in the ointment already because of the council. The sponsorship on the shirt, and you thought that money would go straight to the front of the shirt. So you'll remember at the time we had the Stockport County. You can see we're looking at a shirt on the wall there. I, I have to say, of all the sponsors that we've got, it looked the best. Ro Robinsons has always been. I've always had an emotional attachment to Robinsons as, as a sponsor. As a brewery, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but but Stockport on the front of our shirts well, was a there? real moment well, of pride. Yeah. It does what it says on the tin. It does, it? doesn't yeah. it? Those two and, together, you can see them now on. Uh, the pub wall. This is yeah, Robinson's good radio, in Stockport. Dave. Good Stockport, radio, Dave. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and Dave Goddard, who was the leader of Stockport Council at the time, who used to get pelters, he used to get properly slagged off. City fan, wasn't he? All right. He is well, a city fan. To bring that city up. Fan, just saying. Just saying. But um, you know, he he gave us eighty thousand pounds for that shirt, that shirt sponsorship. And we must remember, this was in a time of great austerity. I mean, austerity still feels like an ongoing thing, but at the time, this was a it was it was pretty brutal. So the council wasn't exactly flush with money. So this forty-five thousand pounds, I I knew that the the renewal of Stockport Council on our shirt sponsor was a potential. It was going. It was potentially it was going to go. I could sense it. It wasn't. I'd been told that that was the case. Certainly, Dave Goddard 
and and everybody who came down to the council to 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 sort of uh, they had a vote on it uh, one night, a special um, Thursday night meeting. There was about fifty county fans there, and I was there. Uh, Foggy, I hope he's well by the way. He's mad yeah, he's yeah. Yeah. Foggy was very involved in that, and um, and we we lost. We lost by one vote. The council voted by one vote not to re not to renew the sponsorship, and it was the fucking Labour Party who voted not to do it. That's what they called, isn't it? The fucking, the fucking Labour, Labour Party. Don't hold it against them. If you're listening to this before the twelfth, yeah, and, <laughs> and and I know these like rules of perda and all the rest of it because we've got the but you know fucking hell, right? So I'm thinking at the back of my mind, well, hold on, this forty five thousand pounds that our man who we're calling Jim has offered us, this might replace in part. The sponsorship deal. So I said to her, I said, uh, said Jim, um, I know you don't want anything, but I've, I've had a recent, we've had a recent bereavement in our family, and um, Saint Anne's. No, no, it didn't work like, it didn't go like that. I came back to you. Let me just interrupt. All oh, right, you okay. So you said to me, you've got this money front of the shirt, and I said, basically, we were told that it couldn't go on the front of the shirt because there was something in the offing, and we didn't know what the offing oh, right, was. Yes, yeah. So we then decided. We'll put it on the back on of the, the shirt. On the back of the shirt. Yeah. And we initially, I don't know how the, how the thing came up, but it was initially going to be Bernardo's. Yeah, definitely St. Anne's Hospice as far as I was No, concerned. no, eventually. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah, but yeah. So when it got to the office, you'd said St. Anne's, and yeah. somebody in the office had said Bernardo's. Yeah, we've got call. So yeah. we get in touch with Bernardo's. We've got some, we've got, we want to put your logo on the back of our shirts. We've been given some money, and it's, as part of the deal, we need to put something on. We're thinking that yours is a great, great charity to put our name behind. That's great. When can you send us the money? So it's, what? Sorry? Well, you said you've been given some money. Can I just yeah. correct you there? Because we haven't been given the money. No, no. but Because it, it, despite the fact that we could have had it transferred that very fucking day to my bank account, and I, we still haven't collected the money. <laughs> yeah. So the idea then is we've gone from being Bernardo's and being told that if we wanted to put Bernardo's on the back of our shirts, we'd have to give them the money that we'd been given, because rightfully they thought it was theirs. So then we go back to them and say, "Who did you want?" Uh, and I'm saying, <laughs> just, "Just take his fucking money." We'll yeah. Sort that out later. We, we've still not had the money, but anyway, that's how. So in the end, you said about St Anne's. Yeah. So I'd had, I'd had a, we'd had a family bereavement. St Anne's Hospice had been incredible. There's lots after that, our family member, and I thought. They're not going to get any directly going to get any money out of this, but it would be nice for county fans to have an association with a local hospice, and maybe over a period of time, the, we could be raising some money. Is it, we're, right, we've got some technical issues going on here. Yeah, carry on. <laughs> they were over the moon, to be fair. Yeah, of course they would be. Yeah, but we still haven't collected the money. No, I know. Right? So, I, I'm contacted on the fifteenth of June, and we are talking about six. Eight weeks later, yeah, still not yeah. collected the money. So this is a football club that's been relegated, is in absolute chaos. The shareholders have threatened to pull the football, pull pull their money from the football club, put it back into the administration. I don't think we really know where the next sort of next year's budget's coming from. A man wants to give us forty five thousand fucking pounds, and we are not organised enough <laughs> to take it. <laughs> So, so basically, we've got this money waiting for us. We've got uh, an idea that now we're going to put St Anne's Hospice as the back of shirt sponsor, which they were over the moon with, as I say. And we put some advert. We put an advert in a program from, and that we threw a bucket collection and yeah. stuff. So you know, they were over the moon that yeah, we were doing were. all this. And then uh, we get told in the office. I get a phone call. Um, where can we have the keys to the media room? Whoa, hello. The keys to the media room, which is under the main stand, so it's like an office that we used. Are you going to tell us about Spencer? No, no, no. We're going to introduce the other guy, the other the fella. The other fella. Right, well, there's something else we've got to talk about. Oh, well, you about. crack on then. I tell you what, we're going to do. Uh, we're going to. He's going to play some music now, probably like a bit of clown music or something. I'm going to do it while, while we sort out all the microphones and all that beer for nothing. Technical issues. Right. Okay. We'll be back after this short message. Right, home game coming up. Where are we going? Like, what's your pre-match plan? Usually Bobby Peel for me. Bobby Peel? What about yeah. you, Dave? Well, we've already established I'm a Tory, so I'll just bring G&T from home and drink it in the back of the car. What about you? How many, how many, where are you going? Bobby Peel? Yeah. How many tellies have we got? 
five, I think. <laughs> oh, mate, mate, you're not going to believe this. You want to get onto the Royal Oak. Why? What's so good about the Royal Oak? We've got tellies, they've got big tellies, they've got small tellies, they've got tellies when you're ordering a drink, they've got tellies when you're having a piss, they've got tellies when you're having a cig outside. Tellies, tellies, tellies! Aside from that, it's a really good place to go before the match, and alcohol is also available. Okay, so, so, we've, so uh, the reason I've told you that is because I, I want you to understand just how shit the <laughs> business is. It's operating to the extent where it can't even take a free gift without fucking it up. We're talking about an abs. We're talking about maybe the shareholders were right at that point. To be honest, we are talking about an organisation that didn't actually deserve to, to be long to carry on, but thankfully it did. Right in the background, something else has been got has been rumbling on for a couple of months, and this is this is a few whispers oh, about this, yeah. but there is nothing much more than that, and. Whenever there's a deal in the offing and all you hear is a few whispers, it's usually a good sign. When it's all like bl bluster and everything else, like the PID document, which we'll talk about at some point, <laughs> um, it, it's about to go fucking wrong. But when he's not really hearing about it, I feel more confident. Okay, So there's something else going on. And it's the, we, the, the word conduit is, is mentioned a couple of times. Uh, somebody called Rod Gunner is mentioned a couple of times. There's another fellow who's a, a, an editor of a national newspaper has been mentioned. I don't think we're going to mention him today. And um, something's happening in the background. Very importantly, I've been given a letter from, by Dave Goddard uh, from Stockport <coughs> Council. And it was signed by him as the leader of the council. And it was co-signed by Brian Kennedy as the owner of uh, the ground. And uh, we talked a little bit about the austerity, and the, the austerity was the concern about whether the, the sponsorship's going to go back on the shirts or not. But there was something else going on which was maybe a little bit more positive because there was European money. Uh, Edgerly itself was, uh, I forget the exact term, but it was an area of economic deprivation. Outstanding like natural beauty, I think. Is the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so an area of ec ec economic deprivation, I'm pretty much sure that was it. Not all of it but happened that, that the bit where county's ground was, was. And there was £15 million worth of funding available. So not £15 million to, to redevelop Edgeley Park, but £15 million to redevelop Edgeley. And Brian Kennedy and the council have got together and said, well, look, if we, read, if we put a, a big stand in where the pop side is now, and redevelop the railway end and redevelop the car park behind it and et cetera, et cetera, Booth Street. Um, we could build something which is fantastic, really, for the community. We could put doctor's surgeries in there. We could put all kinds of physiotherapy and whatever. Um, we can build a small trading estate. Can we put a load of uh, affordable housing on there? Would that count as, you know, regeneration? Well, yeah, of course it would. It would, it would bring extra work, jobs, and places to live. Of course it would. So um, Dave Goddard gives me this letter, signed by him, signed by Brian Kennedy, 15 million quid. And I'm thinking, that's, that's, going, to attract some, that's going to attract some investment, that. Anybody is going to look at that and think, I can make £1.5 million out of that with my eyes shut because it's 15 million quid going to be spent. And so all those active shareholders who were running around with fag packets trying to work out how they were going to get through the first, uh, get through the day. Um, Mary and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, but the other ones started sniffing the idea of uh, we might have a bit of a property deal going on here now. So they started being a bit more interested. Um, Rod Gunner introduces Conduit. Conduit are a massive hedge fund. They would like to build in Stockport uh, something akin to uh, Doncaster Rovers' new ground now. So that's um, not in the middle of nowhere, uh, not like on a big trading estate, but in the middle of a big entertainment complex. So if, I don't know if you've ever been to Doncaster's new ground, but it's, it's not like a lot of... It looks like a... The keep moat. It, yeah, <laughs> the keep moat. It looks like a flat pack from the TV, but actually there's a lot going on around it. It's pretty cool, to be honest. Yeah, I've been, I've been it's decent as well. It's, also, right? it's decent inside. Yeah, it, it is. It's cool, it's cool. And uh, there's like cinemas and restaurants and bars and all sorts of stuff. It's pretty cool anyway. So they, they had the idea that they would, develop, they would build one of these uh, in Stockport. So they got in touch with Stockport Council and Stockport Council were completely behind the idea, like completely. 
So we'd have a brand new stadium. Um, excellent. You've got this guy who's, like I said, he's a, a, an editor of a national newspaper who's um, well known at County. He vouches for this rod gunner, says this guy's a decent guy. Uh, we've got a local character who uh, gets slagged off to death called Steve Matazed, who's been trying to bring investment in the county for, for years and years and years. Uh, he knows through his sort of entertainment uh, connections, he knows the, the guy from the newspaper. And um, they're starting to put something together. Obviously, this takes a bit, a bit of time. And uh, they contact the football club, say the council's on board. We've got these grand plans. It means you getting a brand new stadium for nothing and income from the, uh, from the entertainment centre going forward. And you would have thought at that point that our directors, our owners, would have thought they'd won the jackpot. So they made arrangements to go to a hotel in London to meet the conduit group. So, th so this, just to sort of make that point, or to yeah. emphasise that point, this is a board of directors who've put the club into absolute shit financially yeah. within not, a very... Not, not directors, so let's, call it, let's just say the 2015 group at yeah, this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, okay, to be fair. I put the club into a, a great deal of shit in a very short space of time, and they yeah. were be given, being given effectively a lifeline. Oh yeah, to big walk time. away. Oh, big time! Yeah. yeah. Now it might have come to nothing. Yeah. But the fact that the council were very much on board, yeah. and the council were very supportive of Stockport County at that time, means that you know this this, this needs to be taken seriously. So, uh, about five minutes ago, we were talking about the fact that the football club couldn't even accept a gift of forty-five thousand pounds <laughs> without fucking it up. Mm -hmm. They agreed to meet in London at this hotel. They agreed to meet Conduit and Rod Gunner and this other guy um, on the proviso that they deposited £250,000 in Stockport County's bank account or they wouldn't commence talks. Just for a meeting. It's amazing, isn't it? I'd, I'd forgot <laughs> that is that. a stunned silence if anybody's <laughs> wondering why we've gone quiet. I have actually forgotten about that. Uh, so the response was, uh, was no. <laughs> they, they, Sorry, was the second word off. <laughs> <laughs> the meeting does take place, uh, but they're given some news, right? So what we're talking about here now, to give you sort of put a time uh, on this, on the 1st of July, I think so, this would have been the 30th of June we're talking, 30th of June, the councils voted not to extend the shirt sponsorship. So that's £80,000 they're not getting. So this is the 30th of June 2011, isn't it? Yes. Pre-season, just before... Yeah, yeah. So they've been talking... This, this, the talks with the council have been going a lot longer than they have with the football club, but this idea of county getting a new stadium for free is, is way down the line, and the club... Bear in mind, they don't own the ground. Uh, the club are now being asked to come along to, to discuss it, and they asked for £250,000 to talk about it. Um, but the club is speaking to somebody else. Who are they speaking to, Phil? Well, I think they were speaking to the mystery man in the media room that I nearly mentioned before. Basically, we were told that there was a, a meeting taking place in the media room underneath the main stand, and I wasn't to use the media room that day. I was to stay upstairs under no circumstances was anybody allowed to go into the downstairs because they were having a meet, top-level meeting and nobody was to know who they were talking to. And then my phone rings upstairs. Can you bring some tea, coffee and sugar downstairs and milk? OK. That was one of your 20 jobs. It was, but also, <laughs> surely that would mean I would meet the bloke that nobody... <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I walk in and I recognised a few of the uh, shareholders, stroke board members, directors, whatever. And there was a gentleman stood there admiring county memorabilia that I, I adorned the walls with. And the, the first thing that struck me was he looked like... Uh, John Travolta out of Saturday Night Fever or Randall, what's his name? Randall Locker. He had like, it wasn't a, quite a white suit, but it might as well have been. <laughs> it was like, here I am. I'm a secret man. You're not, you can't see me. I'm dressed in a <laughs> cream suit. And he turned to me, and I'm not going to do his accent because I'm shit out of him. And he goes, all right, mate, you must be Phil. I'm Tony Evans. And I could, I could hear the groans round the table. Oh, shit, he's told <laughs> his name. And he went, 
me and you's going to get on well I love all this I love all this memorabilia stuff we'll get on great and I still don't know who he is I just know he's called <laughs> Tony Evans but me and him are going to get on apparently we did <laughs> <laughs> but um, see that's the thing with me if you tell me we're going to get on I'll, I'll believe you yeah, yeah, just... if, if you don't like me I don't like you <laughs> so yeah and so I go upstairs and of course I'm people Rob Clare who's down there who's down there I don't know mate I have no idea who's done it. Good player, make a note of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and that was my introduction to Mr. Evans. Yeah. And um, the next thing we know, we've got a new sponsor for mm-hmm. the front of the shirt and we've got a potential new chairman. But even more importantly, we've got a potential new manager. manager. Yeah. But we've just got one. So before you get to that, <laughs> <laughs> they opened the meeting at this hotel in London with... Just to let you know, uh, we're bringing a guy called Tony Evans in. To which conduit say, uh, "What? Sorry, yeah, we're bringing this guy in called Tony Evans. He's gonna, he's going to be a investor, owner, blah 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 blah." So the conduit people who've done all this preparation work, the council, uh, they said, "Well, look, if you bring somebody else in now, then obviously we we can't." do anything with it we, we need to we need to get on with this project and you know it's a hedge fund they've got they want to get the thing built when they start making some money uh, uh no no we, we're definitely going to bring tony evans in so we turned down a free stadium to bring in tony evans which as we know was a great decision <laughs> Have you got that tune again, Russ? The <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rival of the Gladiators, or whatever it's there's, called. There's a couple of silences in this that I'll put stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you got the theme tune to Brett. Gotta get up, gotta get out. <laughs> hey, um, so, we then get told that we've got a new manager. And by now, Ray, Ray's come back off his holiday and he's at Manor Farm with Wardy Lordy. And the other thing I think it's quite important to point out that. In complete contrast to the previous season, when we had 96 players that we didn't want, we only actually had three players. <laughs> we had three contracted players, and I've been racking my brain. One was Matt Glennon, and one was Mark Lynch, and I can't remember who the other one was. But I'm sure we had... Well, I know, we had three contracted players. So there's a bit of, you know, Ray's ringing round and Wardy and Lordy. And, and then all of a sudden, we get told, hang fire. We've got a new manager coming in, and it's going to blow your socks off, this new manager. Um, we're bringing in Diddy Amam. And of course, what the Diddy Amam, or a Diddy Amam, <laughs> so, I think a Diddy Amam probably would have done a better job. So, anyway, so nobody's told Ray this. Ray's at work at Manor Farm. And anyway, apparently, he gets asked to come to the ground and they tell him that there's going to be Diddy Amam and uh, you're going to be his assistant. And probably won't need Wardy and Lordy now because we've got this that, and, and we, what you did with Paul Lintz and all this and I'm, I'm assuming that that conversation took place about the Paul Lintz bit because that's the only bit that would make it credible in my eyes because we've got we've got a new manager what's it, the Paul Lintz bit sorry well, he's, well he, he, he helped Paul Lintz get promoted at Macclesfield then he took MK Dons he got them promoted and they won at Wembley and Ray Mathias was Paul Lintz's number two right so do you not pay attention to football outside? Sorry, no. I, I, I just thought, count, I, I are you thought, just counting and that's it? You, yeah. No, but I thought you were talking about Didier. I was just saying, well, no, no, Ray. Right. So they wanted Ray to do a similar job. But they hadn't asked him, would he agree to a pay cut that he'd just accepted, a, you know, a decent pay rise? And you want, Will you go back to being sort of probably less money than you were on as a scam? And, and the previous four or five months has just been fucking nightmarish. So, anyway. yeah. so basically, we've been told that Diddy's got the job and Ray you're going to be his number two and blah 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 Ray declined their nice offer of pay half, taking less than half his wage and being a number two when he'd only just been made number one and said no I'm not interested mate sorry I'm the gentleman he is just said look you don't have to pay me any money I'll just walk away and I don't know if he actually got any money but I know that he, he genuinely was like, so I mean I, I spoke to him in the car park and he was just distraught because you know he built built himself up to taking the job, and he really believed he would do well. And this, that, and the other. although he had signed Martin Grimm, I Martin, how are you? 
<laughs> I quite like Martin. Just wasn't his he's time. Funny. He'd had his career before he came to Galway. Ma- Martin Gritton, one, one of the funniest he, people and genuinely nice bloke. Yeah, as well. he is. Yeah, he's a proper character. He is. But you see, the thing is, he had played for uh, Ray uh, Mac, and he was going to be the sort of striker that Ray wanted. But he certainly wasn't going to be the sort of striker that Diddy wanted. Yeah. So he was at the wrong club at the wrong time. And I, and as I say, I got on really well with Martin, and, and he, I still do, still speak to him, and. You know, he'd, it wasn't his fault. He was brought in by Ray pretty much the day that Ray was told he wasn't the manager. To, so to had, do that, so we had four that. players then. <laughs> to, to do that to, to Ray Mathias, who, as, as we said, they've, they've put him through the ringer for uh, five or six months or whatever it is. He's, um, he's come to county with an, a, an absolutely gold standard reputation as being one of football's good guys. I don't think you ever hear a bad word about him. No, you won't. Still ever, won't. You know. I booked um, into him at Tramway last year and he was like, never, he was, I have Phil, how are you? Yeah. Not, not like, oh, you would like yeah, that yeah. county lot. <laughs> so, a uh, great track record of success as a manager, as a part, as an assistant manager, a uh, great track record of bringing players on. Um, like, you know, he's a pretty much a, a legend in, you know, the sort of. Um, on the Wirral. You know, Merseyside area, <laughs> on the Wirral. And uh, we treated him like that, and you just think, well, it doesn't. What does that say about our, about us as a football club? That's I, I know football is a very ruthless business; it really is. But at our level, we're now a non-league club, and we're doing that to somebody who's actually we're lucky to have. You have to mm. sort of accept that we were still in denial about being well, a non-league yeah. club as well. So, so basically, they thought we get Diddy a man in, we're bound to get promoted, right? So there's a, there's a couple of things. Firstly, Diddy man's never been a manager before. And we've given him 75 grand a year to be the manager of a non-league football club when I think Ray was probably on half of that and then asked to take half again, sort of thing. So it was, you know, we, it was massive money for don't. <laughs> and um, it was, was, a bit was, of a, it was a bit of a gamble though, wasn't yeah. it? Very hey. good, very good. <laughs> so, but there was one other thing. So we've hired, oh, sorry, Tony Evans and his friends hired this really expensive PR company to put on a press conference now Stockport County were a non-league club and suddenly the biggest non-league club there is have announced Didier Mann as their new manager mm. you don't need a PR company you do not you don't but we bought in um, and I mean a really very expensive PR company to build a stage to do I mean we have one in the under the yeah, yeah. we have one but yeah. we've got another one <laughs> you, know, so, so it was like, you can never have too many stages. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. So we had this press conference all laid on for Diddy Man. While this is going on, while we're waiting to go live with announcing Diddy Man, Diddy Man is in the corner of whatever they call the conference suite under the Cheadle end. He's in the corner of Saf- that. Sapphire? Yeah, maybe. Whatever. Yeah. On his phone. Placing a bet. Talking to Sven Goran Eriksson to OK his release from Leicester City who he was a first-team coach with, five, ten minutes before we're going live <laughs> with this announcement that he is going to be... St- so he hadn't even got clearance to be our new manager. That's what we were up... That's the sort of thing we were... We were still doing stupid things like this, you know what I mean? But the fact that, you know, he got the job... I have to say he, he, he made our job, certainly in the media, very, very easy because everybody wants to talk to him all the time. And... You know, his record wasn't great, you know, I'd have to say that. There's, his I, record was what's fair. It wasn't great. Uh, I just t- There's one quick one I'll tell you. Um, Before yeah. you get into the season, though, I'll have to talk about that pre-season friendly at Vauxhall. Well, Walters. I'm just going to come to that. And we'll talk about this in a minute. <laughs> so we've got no, no, no assistant in place. We've got a manager and no experience of being a manager, let alone he knows nothing about non-league, non-league football. Yeah. We did make that mistake again a bit further on. <laughs> so anyway, a couple of days or so, we're told that William at Stay is going to be our new assistant manager. Now, I knew who he was because he's a Scottish footballer. And, well, he comes from a famous family. And so, another guy with a good reputation. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Not, not a brilliant, you know, he'd d- done well as bringing kids through yeah. as a youth team coach and stuff like that. So I get talking to Willie and tells me, um, <laughs> I said, so how have you ended up with a job sort of thing? Well, a mate of mine told me there was a vacancy going and uh, I, I put my name forward. Diddy rang me and said, the job's yours. 
Have you not had an interview or anything? No, 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 not even met Diddy before I came down today. What? So, and then he <laughs> says, and I've got to be honest, I want to get into management. Why, why not learn under somebody who's, you know, like Diddy? Yeah. I can help Under him. one of the best there is no, in management. He can help me raise my profile and I can help him with the coaching side of things and the management side of things and, and I'm in place should it all go wrong <laughs> <laughs> well he was yeah. but, so can, can, um, I, can I just say um, Dave is your neck alright because you've just been shaking your head for the past like 30 <laughs> minutes <laughs> no, it's been okay. very fidgety as well <laughs> you need uh, to move but okay carry on <laughs> <laughs> So can, can I talk about that Vauxhall Motors? Though? I'm just let me go. I'll I'm build sorry, up, I'll, build up to, I'll build up to it. So, Edis a favour and everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're coming to the friendlies. So, we've got these three players. Four, four, four now. Yeah. And oh, by the way, Lordy leaves because Diddy doesn't need Lordy. Right. So Lordy's gone again. Right. So how many times is that now? I've, I've lost count. I was going to count. I you will know, count. You know what? We've got time. Lordy on in a couple of weeks. Oh, he's been. I've got well, see if he knows. <laughs> how many times did you leave county? <laughs> well, in, in, my, know, in, my, un, in my tenure, Lordy was manager, I think, three times in the in the three years. Three and a half. I was there three and a half, four years. And he, assistant manager, or sorry, Caretaker, Caretaker manager twice and manager. manager. Yeah. And th- I had 10 managers in three and a half years. Did they take them all around the pitch? Yeah. When they yeah, were all right. <laughs> so, so the other thing about Diddy was he was banned from driving when he arrived. And Rob Clare had d- done a deal with Infinity, who were a big German car company, had just opened this big <laughs> showroom in, you know, on Portwood. They couldn't wait to give Diddy a, it's still a man. There, yeah, yeah, but they couldn't wait to give Diddy a man a car. Because he's like, oh, brilliant. We've got Diddy a man who's going to be manager of county. It's brilliant for us. Is it all right if his chauffeur drives him round in it? What? Well, he can't drive his band. <laughs> no, we're not giving a car to a bleeding chauffeur. <laughs> so the deal, that was one that, that just went out of the way. His chef was just... So, so hold on. So, we, so we've talked about his chauffeur. His chauffeur is now his chef. About, oh, his chauffeur uh, is his so chef. So his chauffeur is not only is he Diddy's driver, he's also a chef and quite a reputable chef, apparently, in Liverpool. He... he he made his name as a, allegedly being the bookies runner for all of footballers on Merseyside. So because they weren't allowed to place bets, they would go in his restaurant oh. and give him the money and he'd lay the bets. So he became very, very popular. A very funny guy and a brilliant chef, I have to say. Um, my first introduction to him was I got a phone call. It was a new Ladbrokes bookies opening. We'll get in there. In the precinct <laughs> in Woodley. And they knew that Diddy liked him. A bit of a gamble, uh, allegedly. allegedly. So he says to me, "Will you be getting down to open a new one?" So I, yeah, yeah, it'd be great. It's a five hundred pound charity bet. So I said, "Yeah, I think he'll do that. It'll be great. He's done everything up to now that we've asked him to do. Yeah, no problem." Gaffer, got this. Can you? Can, yeah, no problem. I'll get John to drop me off. I'll meet you there. So I drive. I, I, obviously, I live up that way. So I drive up there, meet the manager. I said, "He's here in a minute." Next minute, then he comes around the corner with this driver, stroke chef. And he goes in, he goes in, talks in. So driver stroke chef comes out to me and he says, where's the bag? So I says, what bag? He went, the brown bag. I said, what are you talking about? He said, the reddies, the money. I said, there isn't any. And he's like, again, I'm not going to try a scouse accent. But he goes, we don't do nothing for nothing. He said, there's a brown bag. I said, no, there isn't. I said, it's a £500 charity bet. It's a local charity. And he went... Fuck that. <laughs> he goes in, goes in the shop, starts talking to Diddy. Next minute, the ball, ball, he comes out and he says, I've had to agree. 250 quid charity bet and 250 quid for the, the chef dra- stroke driver. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great fun, this. This is, this is my life now with these two these characters. Um, we're still signing players. For, fortunately, the owner was a lot more salubrious, wasn't Yeah. It? So... I don't know, did Sean McConville play? Yeah, he did. So Sean McConville's signing for us. Now, this is a, quite a coup. And a, yeah, he's regard, got a great reputation. Rega- regardless of what people might think they know about Sean McConville, Sean McConville, when he arrived at Stockport County, came for the money. Um, <laughs> no, he did. And he made well, no secret of it. Well, we, no, he literally made no secret of it. He wrote a story in the paper no. saying, I've only come here for the money. So, so he turns <laughs> up, and I met him, and, he, and, and, and again... On face value, got on really well with Sean, and 
he genuinely, apart from the money, he wanted to show that he was a better footballer than that division. And he clearly was, and yeah, clearly if is. Could, if he could have been asked. So, no, I'm going to come to that. So there. So Sean turns up, and those of you who know Tony Whiteside, Tony Whiteside, meticulous, the club secretary at the time, nothing gets past Tony. It's all got to be done. All eyes dotted, T's crossed. So Sean comes in with his agent, and Tony's like, right, so shut the door. So I... I'm in and out because Tony's printing things that they're signing and comes off at my desk. So I keep coming in and out with pieces of paper. And I, that's, that's one of your other I'm list, yeah, one of, <laughs> So I'm listening to Tony talk to Sean and Tony being long in the tooth and long in football would like to show off to people about what his knowledge about football. And I, Sean's talking to him and he says, uh, and his, his agent every now and then butted in. And on one of my many frequent visits into the office, this fella said something that's quite clearly upset Tony. And Tony turns to him and he said, look, I know you're his agent and everything, but will you just butt out? And the bloke goes, I'm going to try it. I'm not his fucking agent. I'm just fucking drove him here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm his mate. And Tony goes, get out of my office. <laughs> it's like this lad had just turned up on the jolly. He'd brought Sean in his car and he'd listened to every single word and watched every single piece of oh, important <laughs> documentation taking back. How much money Sean was on? It was just, and it, oh, mate, it was funny. Then I'll just tell you the quick Ryan Lowe story. So we're Fox in the so boat, we're in, we're in the meeting, <laughs> me, Tony Evans, Tony Gibbons, um, somebody else, can't remember who else. And we're talking about perspective targets and it's not the Jamie Vardy one that comes later. So, we need to get the fans buzzing. We need to tell them we've signed somebody. A, a mate of mine, Lowy, great player. I said, Ryan Lowe? He said, yeah, yeah. So you play for us. Well, yeah, he'll come back. I mean, will he fuck? <laughs> he just scored like 34 goals for Berry or something. He's not coming dropping down hints and only... No, I'll tell you. He's coming. So I said, he's not. <laughs> it's only... Well, all right, you got me there. He's not. But... He's after a pay rise at Berry, And if we put it out there that we're interested in buying him, he'll get a pay rise at Berry. And, and we was like, well... So, oh, sorry. So, t- Tony, Tony Whiteside comes in and he says, uh, Tony, do us a favour. Just let Berry know we're putting a bid in for <laughs> Tony Evans. And he was like, no, we don't do it like that here. You know, we don't, because he's dead. You know, meticulous, particular and meticulous. So Tony goes out the room and he says to me, you've got any contacts in the page? You've got loads of contacts. I said, yeah, no, loads. He went, just send a text to a few of your, your, your pet uh, journalists, Stockport County, putting a bid in for Ryan Lowe. So I went, it'll, get, it'll come back and bite us in the ass. He said, it's all right, I'll sort it. I'll take the blame, just do it. So just send it to two or three of your, you know, your pet ones. So send it to about three or four people. Just letting you know, mate, we're putting a bid in for Ryan Lowe today. Let's say 50 grand. I don't know what it was. So we're just doing this. And press send. Tony Whiteside walks in not a minute later. <laughs> you, my office now, to me. So I'm going, <laughs> he went, pick that phone up. So I picked the phone up. Is that Phil Brennan? I said, yeah. This is Jill Neville, very football club. <laughs> What are you doing sending messages to the paper that you're putting a bid in for Ryan Lowe when you're quite clearly not? <laughs> sorry, Jill. <laughs> like, Never mind, sorry, Jill. Ring the, those people you've sent it to. Ring it. Don't text them. Ring them and tell them you've lied. Do I have to do that? Yes, you do. <laughs> it's like, so I've then, like, I'm on the phone ringing around. Me, like, oh, so, sorry, mate. It was a bit of a, bit of a gag that went wrong sort of thing. Like, Go back in the room, Tony's at it. What's all that about? I said, oh, mate, you just dropped me in a right load of shit. She's threatening to go to the, the you know, the FA or whatever. We can't do things like that. And he just starts laughing. Ah, well, lesson learned. I'll do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, and this was my life, I told it. But he was funny. I mean, he was a funny bloke, but he just didn't give a shit no. about the stuff. Uh, we're, we're, bet, nearly to, to, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. To be fair, I have to just say, though, <laughs> Jill, Jill Neville demonstrated there you know, just what good hands Berry Football Club have been in for the last few yeah. years. It's she us, she us. was brilliant. I mean, she just like really <laughs> put me in my box. So, pre-season, still struggling for players. We're at a training ground one day and a coach, I kid you not, a coach load of scousers turns up, all 
proper wild lads, all like, oh, all right, damn it, give it all that. That's why I said a team from bread. <laughs> so they're all piled off, and apparently they're all lads that Tony's been around the, the local parks. The most famous one was the pit soccer, where he found John Nolan, who turned up, and I have to tell you, was the most amazing footballer that day. He, was a, he must have only been 17, 18. He was amazing. And still playing in it. Well, yeah, he's playing a good level now, yeah. And again, you, I know you're saying if he could be asked. There's always a reason why players can't be I asked. know that. But I anyway, know. so they all turn up and they've all got nice new trackies on. <laughs> and, With the labels still in. And <laughs> he's... When the, the game's going ahead, they've got like an, an, either an 8 8 or 11 11 but it's... And we're having a look at who's this, who's that. And there's a kid stood on the side, full county kit, training kit, Nike kit, no boots. So I said to him, where's your boots? I left him in. He said, no, no. He said, I've got no boots. So but it's a football trial. He went, I know. I'm all right, though. I'll do it. I said, you can't play with no boots. No, it's all right, mate. He said, whoever comes off, I'll put their boots on. <laughs> and I was like, what if they're not your size? The chances <laughs> of not being your size, it doesn't matter. If they're too tight, I'll just play. And if they're too big, I'll just play. It's all right. Don't worry about it. And sure enough, halfway through, oh, I think in the second half or at half time, they change a few players around and this kid goes on, puts somebody else's boots on. And then, we've, I think out of the 40 ish kids that arrived on that coach, we probably signed three. But we lost 38 full sets of <laughs> Nike training. <laughs> And that's not a lie, we did. We lost every single bit. Question for you both. If you could recreate one sporting moment and be there doing it yourself, what would it be, Russ? Winning put in the 1992 Open Championships to replicate Nick Faldo. Golf then? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't know, not my thing. What about you, Dave? Well, as I'm a Tory, as you well know, so I go and watch cricket. Um, and I was there, along with John Billsbury, friend of the podcast, oh, yes. uh, the Tea Party podcast, and we were both there when uh, Ben Stokes hit the winning runs in the Headingley Test on that famous Sunday a couple of months ago, so I would uh, recreate that. Even I watched that. <laughs> I'm going to have to go for a county moment now, aren't I? Um, top of my head, Glenn Taylor's header for Spennymoor <laughs> against Chortley, all the way. Get it. So why have you asked us that, Ernie? Because... It's a little message from our new sponsors, the Players' Entrance in Merseyway, Stockport, where you can go and recreate many sporting moments. And it's run by a county fan. That's, I mean... And it's got Darren Stevenson on the wall. There's a mural of Darren Stevenson on the wall. Uh, doing an overhead kick, I believe. Doing an overhead kick. I'm going to get on with it. I, I don't want him doing that. Was he actually doing an overhead kick like, as a model for the picture? I don't know. Or... The picture I've seen with him, he's got his broken leg, so... Or whatever he's done. Maybe that's how he broke it. We then... <laughs> <laughs> we then cancel the three local friendlies that we usually have Woodley Glossop and one other can't remember who it was but we cancelled them because we didn't have the players in place to play them and I know it got us in a big a lot of trouble with Woodley because they were our training ground and yeah. stuff like that so we then hastily arranged some new friendlies because we started to get some players in now those of you that don't really understand how staffing levels work in uh, close season people always say ah close season's quietest time it's actually the busiest time so you tend to have your holiday just before the pre-season friendlies kick in so you can or just after so you, you just try and get that bit of time in so I've arranged holiday and the new friendlies coincide with me going on holiday I've just about got a couple in first of which was New Mills and we play a trial list called Leighton McGiven who's from Vauxhall Motors and Tony's keen on him so we bring him in he actually scored that day at New Mills and after the game at New Mills um, Tony's doing his Tony Evans he's, he was very very fan engaged he used to go and stand on the terraces and he was always on Twitter and all this he used to, and he loved it it was, it was good for that reason so I says to him he says uh, he's talking to a set of fans and he says anyway I'll see you all on Thursday we've got another friendly and I looked at him and thought it's Tuesday night. I don't know about this looking friendly. I'm, I'm the press officer. I don't know. He said, yeah, we're playing Vauxhall Motors away. I went, are we? He went, yeah. I said, well, I didn't know about it. And I go on holiday on very early Friday morning. Now, I'll get to, I'll get there, but I won't, you know, somebody else, I'll bring Liam, will do the match report, this, that, and because I'll bring everybody in and I'm fucking straight off after the match. And he went, what do you mean, holiday? 
I said, well, go on holiday. Friday went, you can't go on holiday. It's a football club. I was went, have you been on holiday? He's like, <laughs> yeah, but I went. So I said, well, this is my time and I'm only having a week and I'm going now. Oh, right, okay. So we get to uh, Vauxhall Motors. Now, you've got a Vauxhall Motors story and I've got a Vauxhall Motors <laughs> story, so you tell yours. Well, f first of all, um, I'm not saying I'm the most cynical twat that you've ever met, but I am. You're up the, there. But I am in the top one, right? <laughs> And this Tony Evans is has rubbed me up the wrong way immediately. I, mainly because I'm a great fan of John Ronson, the author and documentary right. maker, right? Yeah. I think he's an absolutely incredible person, um, as well as a brilliant writer and a brilliant presenter. And he wrote a book called The Psychopath, Psychopath Test. And if, if you ever want a book to read on audio of your bit, but it's absolutely incredible. A guy called Hare who was a Canadian psychiatrist, put together the psychopath test. And if you, if you answer yes to, I think it's like 37 out of the 40 questions, then you're a fucking psychopath. <laughs> and uh, they have a shortened version of 20. You're just a nutter then. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you answer 18 or 19 of the most important characteristics, yes, you're a psychopath. And the things like superficially charming... So, like, the white suit, that would be, like, a, a sense of showmanship, yeah? And if you go, if you read John Ronson's Psychopath Test and go through the main 20 characteristics... Does it spell Tony Evans? It, Tony Evans <laughs> is a fucking psychopath based on that test, I was say, right? What are you trying to say here? I, I, can't, I can't understand. And as well <laughs> as that, in a documentary that John Ronson created... There's a little sort of animated section about this psychopath who he goes to visit in Broadmoor, right? In Broadmoor Prison, a, a mental asylum. Uh, asylum yeah. Where he's introduced to an inmate who arrives in a full pinstripe suit with blonde side-parting hair <laughs> and his name is Tony, Right? Tony is a psychopath. That's why he starts. So you've got to look at it. We've got to put it out there. I'm going to put the clip on. And, I, was, and I, I saw this Tony Evans guy, and I thought, you're John Ronson's mate, right? And everything about you is screaming psychopath to me. And I'll tell you what I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing a fucking penny. There's no money here. This is just fucking bullshit. There's no money at all. Now, what would... Uh, anybody want with a football club what is it that football clubs generate every week every fortnight what is it what is it that they generate you, you money cash so football clubs have attracted wrong guns i'm not saying tony evans is a wrong gun. obviously he's a nice guy he's a legitimate businessman but he's it, football has attracted wrong guns because of that cash flow because if you've got cash coming in which nobody's really counting, nobody's really paying attention, then cash has attracted a lot of wrong guns. So I don't know this Tony Evans, I don't know him, but what I do know is I'm not seeing any money. I'm starting to hear some rumours about, about his days at Chester and people he's been involved with there, and we know that they went completely tits up. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, what have these fucking idiots done again? Right? Diddy R, man. What the bleeding hell is he doing there? What does he know about this level of football? He mustn't know any of these players. He mustn't know any of... I bet he doesn't even know what Edgley Park is. So I'm very concerned. But I think, fuck it. It's a change. Change is as good as a rest. We go. And we found out about... Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm thinking this, this guy is... You know, I, I don't know what his intentions are, but I don't see any money. And um, I think we've fucked up. I think we've fucked up again. But the guy is very charming and funny and convincing. And uh, he's held some kind of fan forum. And about 20 county fans have gone up. Ask me anything, ask me anything. And all five questions at him. And basically, he just, he was, he was quite a good politician. He just, like, he dealt with it. And he come back and you've got people like the Recklesses. Who, uh, you know, they're good guys then, but they fucking, you know, they, they don't half like fall in with the pom poms on as soon as somebody else comes on, on the scene. And and I, I met them at uh, Vauxhall, uh, Vauxhall Motors, 
motors. After all that, on, you can't remember the <laughs> on, on the, the th- I'm there again on Saturday. <laughs> on, the thurs- on the Thursday night, I think it was the match. Yeah, it was Thursday night, yeah. And I, I saw him and I said, look, I said, what the fuck are you doing getting behind this guy? He's a fuck, he's, no, he's nothing, this is just bad news, this, this is just bad news. And they're like, no, no, he's great, he's great, he's great. Anyway, I think about 16 or 17 minutes into the game, we're stood behind the goal, sort of over in the corner, and we're looking. And Diddy Arman walks onto the pitch and just stands there like a frozen rabbit. And I said, look at him, watch him. He's, walk, he's stood, he's on the, about two or three yards on the pitch. I said, that man hasn't got a fucking clue what's going on. Watch him. And they're like, no, no, he's just, he's just, you know, he's surveying the scene, he's doing it. I said, watch him. And even then, after about another three or four minutes, just went, oh, fuck. He just hasn't got a fucking clue what he's doing. He's no idea how to manage a football club at all. Might have been a great player, was a great player, but just no idea what he's doing. No. So, we play Vauxhall Motors, we get beat 1-0. Yeah. Leighton McGibbon, I think, plays half for us and half for them. Right. Because Tony's proper keen on him. He's shite, by the way. He's, well, he was too, not good enough for us, but, and he's probably had half a decent career. But at the time, Vauxhall Motors were Conference North, I think. So, after the game, Tony and Diddy are in the car park having a bit of a head-to-head, and I'm thinking, I've got to go in a minute. I won't interrupt him. And in the end, I thought, I'll get a bit closer and he might see me. <clears throat> and they're arguing about Leighton McGibbon. No, we're signing him. Tony, did he? No, we're not. He's not what I'm looking for. It's not what you're looking for. We're signing him. No, no, we're not. I said, listen, lads, I, I could stand here all night and listen to you doing this, but I've got to get off and I'm going holiday. First thing in the morning, just to remind you, I will not be here. I'll have my phone, I'll take my laptop, because I'm going to our, I'm going to house, my mate's house. So you, you can get hold of me via email. You can't, I'm not won't answer the phone, but I can get hold of me or whatever. And Tony Evans said, you really are going on all this? He said, yeah. He said, well, what the fuck are we supposed to do about media and everything? He said, well, Liam's in the office. If you need anything, Liam's more than capable. So he's been home, better than me. You no, know, crack on with him. Well, I'm telling you now, you go on holiday now, you go on holiday tomorrow, don't fucking come back. And I started laughing, and Tony's at it, no, I'm being serious, Are you go on fucking holiday, don't come back, because you're just fucking leaving us in the shit. You can cancel your holiday and go another time. I said, when? Like during the season? <laughs> he said, well, I'm telling you. I went, right, okay, see you later. So, so get in the car, drive on, tell the lads in the car, like, well, <laughs> just told me. So I go on holiday, and... Fair enough, I fire up my laptop a couple of times and I'm looking. And on, he was very busy on Twitter, Tony. He loved all that Just fan engagement. Very, very busy on Twitter. And he's firing. Some called Felching Sucks used to give yeah, him a right yeah, hard time. <laughs> so, you're giving it. And, and one, I'd only been gone about two days, three days. And Billy Burns was one of his antagonists. He used to love getting into him, didn't he? So, Billy said something about, something's not happened at the club, Tony, today. And I've been trying to do this. Whatever it was, it was... So Tony's gone back and go, leave it with me, I'll look into it. A bit later on, Billy, Tony, what's happening? Just leave it with me. That's not like Billy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, no, I think he did wait at least five minutes. So, <laughs> so, he's, so he's gone back, Billy, and so Tony's, <laughs> Tony's put on Twitter, two, maybe three days into my holiday, sorry, Billy, can't do anything about it. Phil's fucked off on holiday, left us right in the lurch. It'll have to wait till he comes back. So I've screenshotted it, sent it to him in a private message, and put, I'm coming back then, am I? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he sends me a message that, I'll give you that one, don't fucking try it again. See you when you get back, enjoy the rest of your holiday. So, so that, that's what he was like, you know, he would like fly off the hand. But we just, you know, then he appointed Graham Shaw, an ex-footballer who'd never worked in the position, I think it was either chief exec, yeah. Was he chief exec yeah, or was, yeah. general manager? But there was a bit of what you called earlier point scoring going on mm-hmm. because Tony Gibbons had, what's the word, not, he'd, he'd called him out in a board meeting and apparently given all the board members a, a, a letter beforehand explaining why Tony Evans shouldn't be part of the club 
and blah, blah, blah. And so they went head to head and Tony Evans was, by the rest of the board members, by now they're in bed with him now. He's here. He's our saviour. He's bring, and he's promised them. He's promised them two hundred thousand pounds. I mean, he's put his name on the front of the shirt and everything. Well, we put it on for him because <laughs> he told us to. Um, so Tony, you, you're just going to have to back off. And that really, that Tony Gibbons sort of backed off and stopped turning up. Which, when they put Graham Shaw in place, Graham Shaw, whether he'd been advised to or just took an instant dislike to, would never be in the office at the same time. Because as Tony, as Tony and Mary, There's a lot of because, Tonys there, isn't there? Yeah, sorry, Tony, Mary, Tony and Mary Gibbons, because he didn't want them there undermining him, and by the same token, they didn't want him there because he wasn't capable of doing the job he'd been brought in to do. So it was quite a lot. It's quite an uncomfortable place to be for the rest of us, because you know we'd had enough shit the season before and all the season before season, yeah so all of a sudden we've, we've got this ongoing <laughs> argument or everything so graham would ring in and say you know are they in yes they're in right i'm working from home today and then somebody say any idea where graham is yeah he's working from home today so what's he actually doing because he's supposed to be here doing all the, the figures and everything else that goes with it and he was supposed to be doing a handover with Mary and Tony, which was quite hard to do when they wouldn't speak to each <laughs> yeah. other. So it, it was really, it was a very uncomfortable time. I'm not, you know, not poor us, but it, it was a difficult time. But then, like, in all those sort of situations, you start to see the humour in it. You know, you're like, well, we're here, we're doing our job as best as we can. And then, and Rob being a clown, Rob Clare is just a clown, funny, funny bloke, and he would... Typical ex-footballer. If you showed a weakness, he would have you. <laughs> he would have you. You couldn't show him any. I mean, the one like Jacko, little Jack, right? Absolutely terrified of balloons, and you would constantly come in and there'd be a balloon. Uh, balloons. Bal yeah, I don't like balloons, and he'd just sit and there'd be a balloon person sat in his chair, <laughs> <laughs> and, and he couldn't move it. So, so, but Rob was like that. Brilliant, brilliant. You just didn't want to get on the wrong side of it or show him any sort of weakness whatsoever. So, we. are he start, we start, to be fair, once Mary and Tony stopped coming in the office, Graham started coming in a lot more, but he'd disappear for hours on end and none of us knew where he was. And then one day, I think they were due in, and he'd said to me and Rob, right, listen, we need to have a boys' meeting. He said, but we'll have to do it off-site because we don't want fucking ears. So then I'm like, it's the first time you've actually really spoke to me, but you want me to go for a meeting because you don't want ears. He says, so, so you and Rob meet me outside in about 20 minutes. I'll walk out, give it 20 minutes, I'll meet you outside. So I said, so Rob, what's that? So, so we go, and he stood out on the front on his phone that he'd actually remembered that day because I think he must have lost about half a dozen phones because he used to come to work on the train and leave them on the window where you get the <laughs> signal and they'd get off the train and leave the phone on the window. But... Oh, burner phone, is that? So, so uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I think something else is going on. So this... We go out, so he says, right, we'll, go and we'll have a walk up on Swedgley, we'll go and get a brew. So we walk up in the little cosy caff on the corner opposite the Bobby. He says, yeah, we're going here. So we walk in, as we walk in, everyone goes, hiya, Graham, usual, <laughs> is it? <laughs> and this is where he's been going every day. <laughs> so, so when he was supposed to be in the office working, he'd be sat in this cafe, having, and he used to say, chicken, or winner, winner, chicken dinner, that's what we'll have, winner, winner, chicken dinner. And then, to be fair, that became our usual meeting place. If ever he wanted a meeting with me and Rob, that's where we went. And it just, it, it just I mean, it sounds a bit petty and all, but it's just like, he's supposed to be at the club doing a job, but you're hiding from the two people you've replaced. But, I mean, they, they were just the sort of things that were going on. I'm trying to think what else there was that was going on. We um, Some odd financial transactions. Yes. Yeah. But I think we eventually got to the Football League season, or sorry, the, the conference because yeah. it was a conference yeah, conference. yeah. Uh, so of course we're Stockport County and we're going to be on the telly aren't we first game Forest Green yeah. and it has to be the longest distance done it Friday night Forest Green mm -hmm. and we'd all made all these jokes about playing Forest Green because nobody knew anything about it oh, but you've been the sort of place where you get stuck behind a fucking A-Rick and it was yeah. we did <laughs> um, and to be fair nice the club itself was alright it smelt of cow shit because they sprayed it on the pitch you know, it was terrible they did actually it's all that carbon li neutral liquid yeah, shit sort of stuff, isn't it? and um, they'd sky with air and they'd said to me right can you make sure that we have the chairman for a, a, an interview 
at half time. So I said, yeah, of course we'll. Told Peter Snape. Right. right. So we kick off. I think we were winning 1-0. Right. Yeah, we were. We, we got no penalty. Best penalty no, ever No, 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 it wasn't. No, Chadwick. No, we, no, we, Chadwick. I did oh, yeah, it was, Chad, yeah. I thought we equalised late on that. No, they equalised late on. Oh, no, we're not going to argue about that. No, I'll tell you. It was the guy with the Russian name, Tolakowski or something. He, he, he equalised for him. Jan something Kowski. Anyway, so okay. we've scored. Okay. Nick Chapman. Nick, Nick Chadwick. Nick Chadwick, even. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> comes half time, and there's a, there was their little boardroom, very sort of small. Have you been there? No, I've never right. been So there. it's like the, the boxes are very close to the stand. It's all pretty much well, port cabin type thing, but it's yeah. nice. It's all right. So Snape is, is in... Sorry, Lord Snape's in this... Um, <laughs> the uh, box behind us waiting for Sky to come and interview him. So he, he eventually shouted, uh, Phil, where, uh, where's this bloody blow from Sky? I said, he's on the telly behind you. <laughs> so they look at the telly behind him and Sky <laughs> are interviewing our new chairman, self-appointed new chairman, Tony Evans. Walking around the penalty area. Yeah, on the where pitch. all the county yeah. fans are. Yeah, so yeah, it's I, like, I remember watching it. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> oh, mate. It was like... <laughs> it was just like... It was incredible. It, John Ronson didn't interview his, him. His face was like... He's not that bloody chairman. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd, he'd introduce, introduced himself as that. So, I suppose... I mean, really, and actually, um, being a chairman does matter because we got into real trouble by well, not having a chairman, yeah, well, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair... The position was, of chairman really when matters. I, earlier on, I talked about this list of things that you couldn't, you shouldn't do yeah. Once you drop into non-league, yeah. and, and on that list were things that I suppose it's a should do as well. I shouldn't do. So there's don't tell your fans you're going to go straight back up because it also gets the backup of every set of team. Yeah, you've you, you, yeah, you, you basically down. written their their half time or their pre-match talk, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. So there's that. One of the other ones, and this is the most important in my eyes, and something that took Stockport County as a club in my opinion, and I'm allowed to say it because it happened while I was there, it took Stockport County many, many, many years of non-league football to actually understand this. You make friends in non-league football. You turn up en masse as a board of directors in non-league football. You see how many times when a club comes to Stockport County, the old boys in the Blazers with the club crest on, never, ever have we grasped that we might have sort of grasped it now, but in the first sort of two and a half, three years of non-league football while I was at the club, we would regularly turn up at clubs with one board member, two board members. And we it's even, an insult, isn't it? And yeah. even yeah. one, we went to Grimsby on the na- bit later on in the season, but we got thumped. Not a single board member turned up yeah. on a Tuesday seven, night in Grimsby. 7-1? Seven, seven, one. One. Seven, yeah. yeah, seven nil. Seven nil? Oh, it's got one. I thought it's got one. Uh, but anyway... So this was something that during the season, and I'd made a point of this, during yeah. the season, we actually didn't get any better at it. And the worst thing was Southport, their chairman, Charlie Clapham, was on the board of the conference. And when Southport comes to town, they come to town. There's like half a dozen, maybe 12. But, but you're, t- you're talking about football clubs where it's, it's a... It's, a sort it's of an vol- only family. It's a volunteer level. Hmm? Those volunteers are usually writing a checkout every year as well. And so that kind of... The little bit of pomp and ceremony that comes with it, that's their payoff. That's what they get. Yeah, about. They, they get to be and it's yeah. like the Lord Mayor for the day. But it's a club, though, isn't it? That, that, that's well, the essence of a club. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to jump forward a little bit, but people might think that's a really petty thing to point out. But I'm going to prove the, that, that that works against Stockport County. And, uh, well, I say prove. I, I have no written proof. But that being part of the non-league family, we as a club, certainly in my time there and certainly in the next few years after has never ever been grasped because we've upset a lot of people yeah. in our time certainly that first few years because we're big time Charlies and yeah. we, none of us actually went and none of the staff none of the players not, no, nobody actually walked around going oh we're too but good but it costs you in invisible ways because like you, I watch loads because I live in Tameside yeah. and I've done for 20 odd years before we got relegated into non-league football my, well, my, I do. I, my, I've my always best mate it. and my neighbours and what have you you just go watching Night United and you know Staley Bridge and all that because it was a fiver. Uh, not I mean when County weren't playing, obviously, 
And I used to enjoy watching non league football, and that was the camaraderie was what he enjoyed about it. Yes, they wanted to win, but actually they were just there having a bit of a laugh and a game of football. Well, where it came uh, back to so bite just, the squad. Just to say, though, the thing where it goes against us, you get a player who's actually half right, and there's like, oh, you don't want to go to Stockport, they're a bunch of mm. wankers. Well, the real reason it bit us in the arse was about three or four seasons later, two, three seasons later, two, three seasons later. Anyway. We finished in the bottom four in the conference. We sold it. it was the second season. So mm. the seat, not this season now, and I probably should wait for this for next time, but it's on my mind, so I'm telling it now. The end of the following season, we avoided relegation the first year. This season we're talking about now, we just about, and I'm yeah. probably spoiling the plot for everybody, but we nearly got relegated. <laughs> we haven't even talked about any matches yet, but we nearly got relegated. Um, the following season, we managed it. We got relegated. But we finished... Fourth from bottom. Yeah. And five, I think four out of five, I've got to get my facts right, but, but I think it was four years out of five previously, the team that finished fourth bottom didn't go down because of the intricate rules in non-league football. Somebody always went bust or somebody didn't have the ground grading or something happened, something happened. Yeah, golf, South divides uh, and yeah, all that. And the team that finished fourth, in, fourth bottom of the conference, as it is now the National League, didn't go down at the... AGM at Celtic Manor yes glad to say our friends from ex club there are staying in the conference this year due to the unfortunate blah 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 so this is only two years into our non-league journey and we're still upsetting people because we're not we're still being big time Charlies and we're not you know play and when clubs come to us we're not really overly you know nice to them and I don't know what goes on the boardroom but I know that we're not we're not going to their ground and that's what they want to see and we're not doing it I mean, I've been on many, many grounds in the, certainly those first two seasons where when we went to Braintree, there was only John Fitzpatrick who wasn't on the board and Peter Snape. So we had one board member. We went to Grimsby, no board members. Me and Grace Conroy actually had to represent the club in the boardroom before the game and at half time. And I was supposed to be doing this, that and the other. But so, you know, so we didn't. It's 20 jobs. <laughs> so we sort of like, <laughs> we didn't make any friends. And in some cases, probably made a few enemies. Mm. So we finished fourth bottom. And we got a whisper at the end of the season after Kidderminster and everyone was really, really down. We're getting relegated and blah, blah, blah. We get a whisper that Aldershot are coming down from the Football League in administration. And the rules of the conference are quite clearly state any club that comes from the Football League in administration will not be accepted into the conference they automatically miss that division <clears throat> and go into the north or south, dependent on where they are. So we're getting a bit excited at the club. Actually, we're not going down. We deserve to go down because we're shit and we finished fourth bottom. But actually, it's looking quite good. And then, and obviously we've got new people at the club at the time, and they're all getting a bit giddy. And, and I rang around a couple of people and he said, <laughs> don't get... And I'll tell you what it was, I won't mention names, but it was a guy from the non Lee paper, who I actually work for now, but rang me and said, uh, you're, not going, you're not staying up, you're going down. And I said, how the fuck do you know that? He said, believe me, I know, you are not staying up. There will be a rule change at Celtic Manor and Aldershot will stay in the conference and you will go down. The rules are being changed as we speak. And I remember talking to a, a certain overgrown student about it who was really getting giddy about going down there in his nice pointy shoes and his student air that he was going to go to... I think we we'll can come back to him and <laughs> that point. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I'm just saying, so it yeah. did, there, it did yeah. come back and bite us in the arse. Yeah. So I think really, briefly, we should talk about the football that season. It wasn't great. Yeah, it's so, fuck all to talk about, isn't well, it? First I, I 19 few, games, we were well, fucking wank. No, I, I, there's something <laughs> I do need to tell you, so... Oh, yes. So the first few games, lots of draws. I think two wins. Yeah. Two wins, seven draws in the first eight, first ten games. The last of those games was that we're away at Tamworth. And, and I know I might sort of upset a few people. You know you're not supposed to gamble on your own club. You're supposed if to you're, gamble at all. If you're if a you member watch. of a board or you're, you work for a football club, you're not really supposed to gamble. But there was a member of our staff above me above my pay level was known to be laying bets on us finally breaking our duck and winning away from home when we played Tamworth away and this person was actually quite well known around that area so it was a bit daft going placing bets because word gets around 
So we placed a few bets, and you shouldn't be doing that when you're in a chief exec, should you? In any uh, role. In any role. So anyway, we're winning one nil. Nick Chadwick again. I think it might have been a penalty again, but it was right in front of all the county fans, top end of the hill, because the ground's on a hill. And everybody is looking very happy around where we are. And there's, by this time, there's quite a few scouts who have started following us away from home. But they're all wearing club ties, no matter what they've got on. Some of them have got T-shirts and jeans, but they've still got club ties on so they can get into the boardroom at half time. It was quite comical. I wish I got some photographs. But we'd start to get this little gang of scousers. So one guy in particular wore his belt. Was it like a belt? He had like a, a club tie around his pants to keep his pant up. So there's about eight or nine of these lads, well oiled away, and we're winning. And they're making as much noise in the corporate bit because we're winning one nil, and their bets coming in. There's a lot of money apparently <laughs> been laid around the Tamworth area. Ashton Christie scores a lot of goals, doesn't he, in non-league football? How many times has he scored against us, him? And I think he had one chance in the whole game, and it was in the 91st minute. And I've never seen so many sad Scouse people in my life in one go. I've seen quite a few sad Scouse <laughs> But yeah, so we drew the game one all, and they lost all their money, which they shouldn't have been gambling anyway. Um, we then... <laughs> we then went on a few more games where we weren't winning but the funny oh there was another thing at Tamworth before the game do you remember Phil Sprouse who used to play for Port Vale there's a statue of his family outside Port Vale the, the brother the father the son they all play for Vale and he was a very he was like a legend at the club he works for PA he's a, a, a journalist yeah. freelance uh, Press Association yeah Press yeah. Association so Phil sat behind us and we're having a chat with him and JK knew him as well so we're having a good chat with him and all of a sudden he goes what the fucking hell is that <laughs> so we all turned to look at the pitch John Miles was had obviously been told before the game he wasn't in the match day squad he wasn't put to, so go and do a run around the pitch you know the walk of doom thing go and do that <laughs> run around the pitch <laughs> But John Miles had decided, because he was a little bit overweight and didn't really want to be at Stockport County, just like the money, he was just doing half laps. But he was that fat and that overweight. Phil Sproulson, who by then was quite a rotund gentleman, he wouldn't mind me saying, said, I'm just going to go and have a race with your fucking centre forward <laughs> around the pitch. It was really, I mean, you had, probably had to be there. But that's the level of footballer we were attracting. He had a good name, John Miles. He'd, Music was my first was one of my favourite ever songs. But <laughs> he, uh, he'd been a player, obviously been a player, but he wasn't a player now, and we were paying him quite a decent wage. He was one of our top earners, I believe. But he would just, you know, that's what... So we had a really poor run of games. We couldn't buy a win. And then we were playing Bath away. Bath. Bath yeah. away. And the night before, did he was in the office, and he was, like, scratching his head, and I said, what's the matter, Gaffer? He went... <sighs> we're struggling for tomorrow. I haven't got a right back. And I said, "Why? Well, what's the I can't remember who was playing right back for us at the time." And he said, "He's out injured. Have we got Joe Edwards in on loan? I can't remember. We'd, we'd, we'd struggle with right backs." And I said, "What about Lynchy?" And he went, "He's shocking." I said, "How do you know?" He went, "Well, the lads have told me he's shocking. The training, there's such a body said he's shocking." I said, well, he's been injured for a while, but if we haven't got a right back and he's fit, surely he's the answer. He went, but if I play him and he is shit, it makes me look worse than, it makes me look really bad. I went, well, much as I know we've got a good following, there won't be that many of us down at Bath on a Tuesday night. I'd play him. And I think if you tell him he's playing tonight, I think you'll get a good tune out of him because he's not bad on his day. The one thing he's not, you know, he's, he was good going forward and yeah, he wasn't the best defender. He had a great cross on him. But he wasn't, he hadn't played. I don't think he'd ever played for Diddy. So I said, look, it's just my opinion. I've seen him in training, he's fit, he's ready to go. You're saying you haven't got a right back. My opinion is you ring him tonight and you tell him he's in the team tomorrow and he's travelling. So <laughs> we, go, we go to Bath. Lynchy comes over to me and goes, Cheers, mate. I'm playing tonight. Thanks very much. I know it was you. I said, How do you know it was me? He said, Because the gaffer told me nobody else thought it was any good but you said. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? He was brilliant. And he made the first goal, and he had a hand in the second goal. We won 2 0. Michael Patton scored. Peyton, Patton, Scottish guy. And he was brilliant. And I, I remember thinking, You know, 
I was right all along. He was shit the next game. Like that. Um, <laughs> but no, it, 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 that just to me, you said that he didn't have a clue what he was doing. Rabbit in the headlights. Like. So basically, he'd been told that Lynchy was shit, so he wasn't going to get, get him a chance. But he was prepared to go and play a right winger or whatever at right back because he'd been told he was shit and he'd well, never actually give him a chance. It sounds like he'd never actually seen him in training either. Well, he couldn't have done. Well, he didn't, to be fair, he didn't really take training. Will he took training? It's fucking... Yeah, but that's one It's one thing being a World, World Cup winner. European yeah, Cup you're winner. Champions League winner. Champions League winner, not World Cup winner. He wasn't, was he? I think but, he did not have a World Cup. Oh, was he World Cup as well? I think he was, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's one thing being that and being in the centre of midfield for Germany. It's another knowing non-league football. Any 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 type of football. Daniel right? Kalasic, anybody? Anyway, so... <laughs> okay. So after the, bar, after the win at Bath, we... We played a couple more games. Um, we lost at home to Forest Green, and we played Hayes and Yedin at home. Oh, I remember it. We were three one up with about ten to play. Three all. They and brought, they, they, Tom br- Collins they, played for them. Yeah, but they brought on their their keeper got injured. Did they bring on the goalie coach who was signed on for them or something? Some something small like black dude. I remember saying to me at the back of Sheerland. Can you we're say out. that? What? Yeah, of course, you can. Just ask him. what? <laughs> Dude. <laughs> uh, I remember saying, um, we're having these now, because this keeper, he, he looks shit. I mean, he's five foot five, you know, he's rotund. As, as I think he was before. the assistant manager, I think. Oh, okay. I think so. Well, yeah. I don't know anyway, but well, carry on. Anyway, he comes on, he fucking shits up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, and we drew three all. Yeah. Uh, and I think... I think it was around this time that Tony had, Evans had decided he'd had enough or he'd thrown his toys out because he was Probably because he hadn't paid had, £200,000. Yeah. I think was, they'd been giving him an ultimatum. And was being asked yeah. constantly when he were getting the money. And So he disappeared and then after the A's and Yedding game, did he resign? So hang on a second, how, so how did Tony Evans actually go? Did, was Lord did, Snape saying, well, where's the money? If you don't stump up, then you need to well, go Well, I think he just didn't come what, back he, in one day. It that, was just basically it, it. And it, and it was just. But I do know that it was said that after the the board had agreed that he couldn't stay because he hadn't come good with the money, even though we'd put his name all over the shirts and stuff like that, that somebody was allegedly said, "Well, let's not upset him because we might need to bring him back." Right? Oh, yeah, you yeah. Somebody on one of the board members. So, but he, um, <laughs> will him stay now gets his chance. Because that's what he's here for. If it goes wrong, he's in place. And we played Ebb's fleet away, he's one game in charge. And we were winning 1-0 at half-time and still lost 2-1. But the one little thing about that, Andy Morell was at the game. Andy Morell, who was out of work, was, was looking for another, a job at the time, had came over and sat with us and he said that... And I, I'd said to Jacob, you know, Andy Morell, he's come a long way for... for so... He, come, he paid his own way, even paid to get in, didn't ask for a scouting ticket. He got a dossier in his hand about us. He'd been watching us for weeks and none of us had actually seen him. But he'd been, and he, he, he shouts me over and he goes, um, just need to ask you about such a number and such a number. I said, right. I said, um, are you putting your name in for the job? He said, I am. He said, but I don't expect to get it because I know Jim Gannon will get it. He said, but I've got to be professional about it. So I've come down, paid myself. I'm proving that I can do the job. My CV's gone in. I expect at least an interview. Didn't get one, which is fine because we all. Get, you didn't get an interview. No, no nobody got interviewed. Yeah, Jim got the job. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. No, no. Delighted that they gave Jim the job. That was absolutely right. But Andy Morell is the type of person I'd interview, mm. so that I'd so have we've him got in the back pocket yeah, yeah. for next time. Yeah. So, and and I, and this this happened, <clears throat> and somebody that I'm going to talk about might say it didn't happen, but this happened. So. We're in the office, and there's a, a lord of Snape ship in the office, and I said to him... A lord of Snape ship? No, the lord of Snape ship. Oh, oh OK. <laughs> and I said to him, well, you know what the fans want, don't you? Fans want Jim back. And the words, I would rather have pins stuck in my eyes than have that... <laughs> ...back at the club, were uttered. But they weren't uttered by me. They were uttered <laughs> by this other gentleman in the room. And I looked at him and thought... Wow, how, how important a person in the oh, role get, of the football? It gets worse. Club, it gets worse. This. Do you think you have to be to think that your preference mm. would be higher 
than the fans demanding a club legend back at the club. But, but not only that. So hang on. No, so no, 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 just one second. I've got, well, I don't speak much on these. So I'm going on. <laughs> right, you've had enough. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how? Just put on your point, Dave. That very same thing for someone who doesn't know football. He's not a football. Snape's not a football no. person. There was never a player. Was never a manager. So to say that it's just. A personal thing, isn't it? It's bonkers it's is what it is. Stupid. So the next day he appoints Jim and I have to write the, con- the the press release saying he's really, really pleased that Jim's agreed to come back and all this lot. <laughs> and I wrote it and I asked him... Did you feel dirty? I thought you would rather have pins stuck in your eyes <laughs> than have that... <laughs> ...back at the club. <laughs> and his response was... It was a win-win situation. The fans wanted him. I've given them what they want. If he succeeds, I've given them what they want. Yeah. If he fails, <laughs> I've given them what they want. Yeah. And that was... And, and they fucking wanted him out from the moment he arrived. Oh, well, that's next season. That's <laughs> next season. So we'll... we'll that, that was really... So... I am sort of wrapping it up because there's no worth talking about football stuff if anybody else wants to add it. But that, that was my little take. Oh, no, there's one more last thing. So we had a player who arrived in December and it's very important because Jim did take the job and we lost four or five on the bounce very heavily. We had some proper... Well, seven, seven nil at Grim- yeah. Grim- Well, we lost one nil at home to Southport and they were down to ten men after five minutes. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it took over a shower of shit, to be fair. You know, he had no, he had nothing to work with, and he was trying to get the best out of the shit that was there, and also try and bring a few people in. But by the end of the season, I think we brought in, I think Danny Rowe, Danny Rowe, who's now at Fylde, had come in. Yeah, yeah. We'd had a few of the um, college lads like Attersley and you know people like that had come in. So we he'd started to get a little nucleus, and we put a little run together, and we got enough wins. I think I've got I wrote it down somewhere in the last seventeen games. We only lost five, and that doesn't sound a lot, but if you look at what went before it, yeah, yeah. we drew four and won eight. So the, the form that we showed under Jim, whilst he's putting together a squad and getting rid of a shower of shit, was phenomenal and vital to that little run, or great run, but let's not belittle it because it was a great run, it was a chap who come from America and played for Charlotte Eagles, never really played at that level before, yeah, yeah. came in December... Was there ever a player that arrived at County who you all wanted him to succeed? Yeah. <laughs> player of the year for the club, player of the year for the conference stroke North West yeah. player, absolute gentleman off yeah. on and off the pitch, joy to work with, never a bad word about anybody and just generated so much good mm-hmm. f- feeling around the club. Scored, I mean, the, the fact that he scored in the last game at Hazen Yedin to... Sort of with all his family over from America, it was just it was you know boy the boy done good sort of thing, and you think we are well, talking about Joe Connor, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Joe Connor. Yeah, yeah, he was outstanding. Yeah, and so grandson of Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dad. Well, I was at the game when his dad broke his leg playing for County. Um, but yeah, how was that game? Yeah. Behind the scenes, is a, a new character turned up as well, isn't there? Uh, was that Spencer? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, we're not. I can't remember the exact date. I mean, by after Tony had gone, I think, and I'm a bit hazy with this, but we'd we desperately needed an input of money, and uh, Spencer had done something at one of the clubs up in Scotland, hadn't he? Where he got the club, saved it, and gave it back to the club for a quid. And then my initial meetings with with Spencer were along those lines. I think that was his initial plan. Was he hadn't come to County to make money yeah. he'd come to county to carry on his philanthropy an adventure yeah. Yeah. Good yeah. Word. Um, and everything I, I haven't really got a bad word to it's say about it yeah. mouth, I, have no, I mean even though in the end it was Spencer was probably the most re- responsible for me leaving the club I would still don't have a bad word to say about him because we, we had a great relationship we argued like <clears throat> two brothers we, we agreed on things you know we, we, you know, we just got on we got each other and, you know, he was, you know, he came in and initially I didn't really have a lot of dealings with him. At the end of that season, he was more of a, a silent partner. He put some money in. I mean, it was when he came to the club, there was, we, we were told by, I think, again, it was Lord Snape, don't let anybody in or out of this room until 
we come out of that boardroom and he came out with a, a check which was quite a substantial check and told me it was more than anybody else had yeah. put in and he said go and pay that in the bank don't 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 pass go just go straight, <laughs> straight and pay it in the bank and and you know and and that was sort of our introduction to Spencer so, so really I didn't really get to know Spencer at the end of that season it was sort of the next summer and the next season yeah. but my as I say my initial meetings with him were great and even leading up to the day I left you know and I've seen him since I spoke to him since I have a lot of time for him I think he's a great guy and he's actually <laughs> proved to proved himself to be a very top level coach nowadays he's moved right up the coaching ladder he's uh, so what date are we on now then? So well, I'm, I'm saying so now we're at the end of... We finished 16th in the final table. We had no chance of getting relegated. We we stayed... We, we all went down on the coach for the last game of season A's in Yedin. And congratulations to uh, Liam Cash and Grace Cash who got together on that trip and now married all these years <laughs> later. So well done them too. Right, so so the 10-11 the, the season we've got relegated from... The conf- uh, to the conference yeah. and this was at the end of the our 11-12 season. season we've been saved by the skin of our teeth by, by Jim by Jim Gannon and Spencer Fern is involved I'm fairly sure he came in at the end of that season because yeah. we were looking for outside investment so I think it must have and, been. and the reason I say that is because on the 10th of March 2012-2013 so the 2012 so this was for the 2012-2013 season coming up right so we're going to the end of that season Jim's saving us at this point and Spencer's put some money in which is good and you, um, like I've never heard you say a bad word about him that's the truth never. as a Tory whenever I'm down in London and I find myself short of quail's eggs I head down to Covent Garden to replenish my stock and if I want eggs in Stockport I head to at Covent Garden 94 Lower Hillgate in the heart of Stockport Old Town. Come and visit at Covent Garden for quality breakfast and lunch, fantastic coffee, cakes, light snacks, and above all, a friendly place with great service. Open match days. Um, but he comes up with an idea, and I think he was he was inspired by Bradford City. You remember Bradford did the hundred pound season mm, ticket yeah. in Division Four or League Two, whatever it's called now, yeah. and he sold about seventeen thousand season tickets in in League Two, and their average attendance. Well, it wasn't quite that many because a lot of people didn't turn up. Yeah. But their average attendance was about fourteen thousand in the in the bottom division, and they got promoted. Yeah. Uh, and Spencer Fern said, "Right, we're going to have a hundred pound season ticket at County. All we've got to do is can we get five thousand County fans to buy a one hundred pound season ticket? And if we do that, we're going to have five thousand people there. The place is going to be buzzing. We'll take in five hundred grand." Yeah. And then we're gonna have the walk in, uh, the walk ups on top. So you can, I, I can understand where the logic was coming from, until he uttered the words "plus VAT." <laughs> so it wasn't a hundred; it was a hundred pound plus VAT, hundred and twenty quid, because whoever bought a season ticket plus VAT. Mm. And also, it was on the proviso that we created five thousand seats. So if we didn't sell five thousand of them. Then they wouldn't be a hundred pound. They'd be three hundred and twenty-one or whatever it was, and it was like, what the fucking hell? I thought we'd, Jim's. What the fuck <laughs> is going on? We, I thought we were calming down, right? <laughs> but okay, all right. It's a bit of ambition. It's ambitious, right? It doesn't make sense to me, but it's ambitious. So um, it's not working. I think they get applications for about twelve hundred, one hundred pound season tickets. You remember you had to say that you were prepared to yeah. do it, right? Mm-hmm. And um, we, he gave us a date. He gave us a date that it, we, had, we had to have all these applications in for, and it was you know all the all the websites were buzzing with it and everything, and it was uh, something May sixty days. He set himself. 60 days to get these 5,500 100 pound season tickets and I get a phone call on the 8th of May and it's Chris Bramall and I've not spoken to him for a while and he says Dave it's Chris Bramall I could say Dave I need your help with something so I said what is it he said this um, this offer that Spencer's put forward we've got a bit of a problem we're nowhere near it and 
problem is we've put this idea that the season tickets are £100 in people's heads. <laughs> We're not going to get 5500 and it means people are going to have to pay 321 instead. We need some help. So I said, well, what the fuck are you ringing me for? I'm not being funny. What are you ringing me for? He went, you remember that group, Heed, that you put together? So I said, yeah. He said, it was a pity we didn't do that. It was a great idea, that, putting together. Do you think you could get a few of them back together and come up with a, a, um, a, 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 a plan? Something we can sell to the fans? So I said, do you mean put something out there that says, all right, we've not done it, but we've tried our best and spin it? So he said, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. So I said, fucking hell, Chris. No, I don't think I can do that. But if you go back to the earliest uh, Dark Days thing, you remember I rang him up and said, send me £50,000, and he did. Yeah. I owed him at least a go. So I said, right, what do you want me to do? He said, contact Spencer Fern at the club tomorrow, get in touch with him, get that Heed group back together, put this thing out and pull us out of the shit. So I said, right, okay. I said, and when's it got to be done by? He went, tomorrow. The offer runs out on the 10th. We need to have it ready tomorrow so that when the deadline comes on the 10th, we've got something in place. And I went, oh, fuck off. Seriously, fuck off. And we had a conversation for about 15, 20 minutes. And he went on to tell me about his future plans for the club and what they're going to do and everything. And he's trying to sort of, you know, cajole me to coming back round to the idea of helping. And he says, thing is, Dave, he said, Salisbury, Salisbury FC, they have a budget of £275,000 and they survive in the conference. They survive in the conference, £275,000. Remember, he was a director there and an owner there. He said, and uh, we don't put any money in. Now, we've, we've put the money in to secure the club. We don't put any money in at all. The club just survives at whatever level it survives at. And with £275,000 as a budget, it will either survive in the conference or it will get relegated to the conference south. But that's it. The fans put the money in. You pay your money and you take your choice. And we're going to do the same with Stockport County. So I said, on what budget? He said, 275,000. He said, the directors and the owners aren't putting any money in. The fans are going to support the club. And whatever level the club finds itself at, that's where it's going to play. And I said, Chris, we're not fucking Salisbury. We're Stockport County. What are you fucking talking about? And he said, that's what we're doing. So if you've ever seen Project Salisbury, that's what it was. It wasn't an accident. We didn't just end up going where we're going because of shit mismanagement. We went there. We went to the fucking conference north because it For was a plan. Seasons. It was a plan. Now, it, they hoped to stay where they were, but they were more than happy to get relegated as long as they didn't have to put any money in. And it's f it's fucking atrocious. So just just for the listeners, then we're still, and for my benefit as well, probably we're still at the end of the 2011-2012 season, aren't yeah. we? Yeah, we're just about survived. In the we're just about survived, and we're pretty uh, at this by May we've survived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, th and this is where I can come into it slightly because Jim's in charge, isn't he? Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm. I'm asked to come to a co-op board meeting at the co-op pyramid and as I walk in Jimmy sat there at the co-op board meeting um, and I'm not sure if we can, we'll cover this at the start of the next one but board members are around there and within weeks of that meeting and what was said at that meeting co-op board members are dropping like flies and is leaving three board members and I'm one of them right. but we'll start I'll probably start with that next because it's I've, a good I've, place to end it is mm. yeah and I've not contributed much yet but that's probably my little Ooh, contribution hey. to it look forward to that, so <laughs> look forward to that listeners <laughs> okay so uh, let's wrap it up there cool thanks for your time um, as always and we will get the next one out 
I mean, it's the day before Christmas, don't Yeah, they? before Christmas. Yeah. Dark, dark days four before Christmas. I'm actually thinking, I don't know where this is going to end. <laughs> dark days 17 this time next year. <laughs> we will have been taken over by then. We do need it. It will happen. It's you a year and episode, yeah. isn't it? You can work out what it's going to be. It's, we're covering a, a year, a season, an episode, aren't we? So. Well, yeah, well, I don't know, because one of them was only six months, wasn't it? it depends <laughs> on the that was the starter it? for ten, wasn't it? Yeah. Okay, thanks for, your, thanks for joining us. Hope Cheers. the sound's been good. Thanks for having Ta-ra. us. Bye. See you later. Bye. Welcome to the Scarf Begar War, proudly sponsored by the Players' Entrance at Covent Garden Cafe and the Royal Oak Edgerly. Oh, great flicker by Alan Armstrong.